With the successful development of armoured vehicles by the Brazilian army together with the participation of Brazilian companies, Brazil was ready to start its defence industry. Since all the production rights were carried over to the Brazilian defence company for free, it meant that production and development almost completely fell into the hands of these companies. Four companies led the Brazilian defence industry when it came to armoured vehicles and other land-based systems. These were Avibras, Bernagini, Engesa and Motopesas. In this video we will go briefly through Avibras and Motopesas and go more extensively into Bernagini and Engesa, with the Tamoyo and Osorio projects in particular. The defence industry would only really take off in 1977, after Brazil officially cut its military ties from the US and started exporting equipment exponentially. Many dictatorships and other questionable buyers would take advantage of Brazil's, and especially in Jessa's, no-strings-attached policy and their non-political stance to their buyers. If you paid, you got the vehicles you wanted. This set the stage for the Brazilian defence industry to thrive into a golden age during the 1980s, and afterwards towards the Dark Age in the 1990s. Welcome to a new Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host Mark, and if you like our work, please consider subscribing on Patreon or donating on PayPal. All of the funds gathered there are used to pay for the amazing illustrations you see on our website and in our videos. Remember, every little helps. Avibras Aerospacial SA was founded in 1961 in Seo Jose dos Campos by engineers of the Department of Science and Aerospace Technology. Avibras would participate in the development of meteorological missiles with the US, from which they would gain experience and technology to build more advanced missiles. From these meteorological projects, Avibras started developing surface-to-surface -surface and air-to-ground rocket systems. This would eventually lead to the development of the Astros-1, the Artillery Saturation Rocket System, in 1981. The Astros-1 was developed for Iraq, and was used in the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 until 1988, based on the need to have a weapon that could stop massive Iranian attacks. The Astros-1 was a prototype for the Astros-2 which was developed in 1983. The Astros-2 is Avibras' most successful product. Bernagini One of the most important companies in the Brazilian armoured vehicle defence industry, Bernagini was the oldest. Bernagini S.A. Industria e Comercio was founded by Italian immigrants in 1912. They manufactured steel safes, armoured doors and value transport vehicles. In 1972 the company was asked by the army to participate in the PQRMM2 project to develop the X1 tank with Bezelli. With the lessons learned in the successful X1 programmes, the army would start investigating if they could do the same with the Walker Bulldogs that they had bought from the US, which would eventually result in the M41C. The goal was to extend the life of the M41s until the 1990s. By that time, the Brazilian tank projects would have achieved enough experience and development for a new generation of tanks to be accepted into service. The first M41C would be delivered around 1980, the idea behind the M41C programme was to sell upgrade packages. A country could select which upgrade packages they wanted, and Bernagini would subsequently carry out these upgrades. The M41C had a rebored 90mm gun which fired the same ammunition as the EE-9 Cascavel. The M41C had a new engine, among other upgrades, like electronics and hydraulics. In 1979 the Brazilian army released requirements for a new tank which would replace the M41C, christened the Caxias. Together with the Army Technological Centre, Bernardini started developing the X-30 tank, which would later become known as the MB-3 Tamoyo. The name comes from a military alliance of Brazilian indigenous inhabitants against the Portuguese during the 16th century, the Tamoyo Confederation. The first designs resembled the TAM tank, which might be explained by a German offer, as designers of the vehicle, to sell a TAM tank, or a 35-ton tank, to Brazil between 1976 
1977. The prototypes would culminate in the MB3 Tamayo 1, armed with a French 90mm gun, which was built and delivered in 1984. In 1987, the Tamayo 2 was built, and armed with the 105mm L7 gun. The Tamayo 3 was the apex of the Tamayo project, delivered around 1987. Compared to the other Tamayos, the tank was armed with 105mm L7 and incorporated composite armour. In addition, it had a new engine, aiming systems and transmission, among a multitude of other components. Contrary to common belief, the Tamoyos were not rebuilt M41s, but were new designs. By the time the Tamoyo 3 was delivered, the army had also tested the EE-T1 Osorio from Mjesa in 1986, which had gained much praise. The involvement of the Osorio would eventually mean the death of the Tamoyo, and potentially Bernagini as well. Of the two tanks developed by Mjesa and Bernagini, the Osorio was the superior vehicle, and would have been the pride of Brazil, a global status symbol. The Tamoyo was the realistic tank for Brazil, potentially costing half the price of an Osorio. If production of the Tamoyo was initiated, it wouldn't have been as reliant on foreign components as the Osorio. The interference of Engesa with the Osorio, breaking the gentleman's agreement made at the start of the Brazilian defence industry, effectively robbed Brazil of any chance for a national main battle tank and lowered the chances of Bernagini surviving as a company in the defence industry. With the failure of the Osorio project in 1990, the changing political stance on military vehicles, the economic crisis of the early 90s, and the end of the Cold War, the Tamoyo project would not carry on. Engesa Ingenieros Especializados S.A., or Engesa, was the largest and is the most famous company in the Brazilian armoured vehicle industry. Engesa was founded in Sao Paulo in 1958 by José Luis Whitica Ribeiro. Initially, Engesa focused on the production of oil prospecting, production and refinement equipment. One of the challenges for the Brazilians to drill for oil was to get the equipment to the location through bad infrastructure during rainy seasons. As a result, Engesa designed their 4x4 traction systems in 1966. Soon after, 4x6 and 6x6 traction systems for trucks were developed as well. Through the total traction system, Engesa would make its way in the Brazilian defence industry. They were hired by the Brazilian army to supply them with several hundred new trucks and the modernisation of older vehicles. In 1969, Engesa introduced its flagship suspension for wheeled vehicles, the boomerang suspension. Only a single axle was needed to drive the four wheels, which were in constant contact with the ground, providing constant traction. At the same time, it was a simple, resistant and relatively cheaply constructed system. Although not fit for heavy vehicles, it was perfect for the armoured vehicles that Engesa would start to manufacture in the near future. With Engesa's development in refitting the army's trucks with Engesa's total traction system and the development of their boomerang suspension, they were contacted by the army to help develop wheeled vehicles together with the PQRMM2 team. This joint development resulted in the EE9 Cascavel and the EE11 Urutu. The EE9 Cascavel was the most successful armoured vehicle of Ingesa. It was originally designed by the PQRMM2 team together with Ingesa as a reconnaissance vehicle in 1971. The Cascavel with a 37mm armed turret would be sent to Portugal for trials. Portugal was, at the time, still fighting the war of Ultramar against their colonies in Africa. The Portuguese, who operated the AML-90, a French 4x4 vehicle armed with a low-pressure 90mm gun, suggested rearming the Cascavel with the same armament as their AMLs. As a result, the Cascavel received the armament which enabled it to take its place in the third world arms industry. The first export sale was to Libya in 1974, and consisted of 200 Cascavels. This order of 200 vehicles enabled Engesa to build a dedicated factory for armoured vehicles in São José dos Campos in São Paulo. From there, they started selling Cascavels and Urutus to countries in South America, Africa and the Middle East. 
the resulting sales would help Injesa grow exponentially as a company and provide the funds to initiate their own development. The EE11 was the vehicle with which Engesa thought it would conquer the market. Named the Urutu, it was a wheeled amphibious troop transport designed around 1971. The Urutu was designed for both the Brazilian Navy and for South Africa, which at that time held a competition for a new wheeled vehicle, which would result in the Ratel. Although it did not manage to get the sale to South Africa, the Urutu was the embodiment of Ingesa's tailor-made on-request policy. The Urutu would come with various variants, from a fire support vehicle, an anti-air vehicle, to a recovery vehicle. Ingesa was successful for a couple of reasons. Primarily, the vehicles were cheap, simple, reliable, and capable. Also, they had their infamous no-strings-attached policy. Practically, this meant that they did not care whom they sold their vehicles to and what the buyer did with those vehicles after they bought them. This business practice meant that countries which normally would not be able to buy equipment from the West were now able to have a reliable supplier of vehicles, components and ammunition. Engesa's business practice is best described with the following statement from their brochures. Engesa, as a true ally, neither creates dependence nor imposes commitments. Apart from its no-strings-attached policy, Ingesa built vehicles that fully catered to its customers. Customers could select their engines and variant, but also ask for specific changes to meet their requirements. From the mid-1970s, Ingesa started developing its own armoured vehicles, which in contrast to the EE-9 and EE-11, were not initially developed by the army. This new line of vehicles was meant for export first, and any interest from the Brazilian army was a bonus. This did put Engesa at certain risk, as the design of the vehicles is expensive, and they did not have the safety of their own country buying them. But most of these vehicles were built with a certain market or customer in mind. One of these vehicles was the EE-17 Sukuri, named after the Anaconda, one of the first purpose-built 105mm armed wheeled tank destroyers. It was never exported and would form the basis for its successor, the EE-18 Sukuri. Another vehicle they designed during this period was the EE-3 Jarakara 4x4 armoured car, named after the South American venomous pit viper. With all the growth and success which Ingesa seemed to have, they would find their first setback in 1981. Brazil went into a recession from 1981 to 1983, as a result of an oil embargo and bad economic policy intended to deal with the country's deficits. Although having sold equipment worth around 76 million US dollars that year, 57 million less than the year before, Engesa was late paying its employees, who subsequently went on strike. In addition to being late paying their employees, Engesa also failed to pay the FGTS, a type of severance premium reserve fund which the employer has to pay when they fire an employee without a good reason. These events caused Engesa to find themselves in excessive debt with high financial expenses, short-term loans and low capital. This was the point where Engesa should have taken stock of the situation it found itself in and focus on stabilising and getting its finances in order. Instead, Engesa neglected these problems and would expand at a megalomaniacal rate. In between 1984 and 1987, Engesa expanded its empire further by buying three companies. At its height, the Engesa empire owned or had a large share in 15 companies or subsidiaries. This expansion was much quicker than any of the other defence companies in Brazil, but also caused Engesa's financial situation to become even less stable than it had been before and caused the company to be more susceptible to any setback it might have financially. Despite its financial struggles in 1981, in 1982, Engesa would begin its most ambitious project it had ever undertaken. It would step into Bernagini's territory and start designing a main battle tank. With the Brazilian government having released requirements for an MBT in 1979, and an upcoming tank competition announced by Saudi Arabia, José Luis Whitaker Ribeiro made the final decision for Ingesa to develop an MBT. 
The EE T1 Osorio was named after Manuel Luis Osorio, a Brazilian officer and hero during the War of the Triple Alliance and patron to the Brazilian Army Cavalry Branch. With the construction of the Osorio, Engesa trod into Bernagini's territory, and effectively, both companies competed with each other for the sale of their vehicle to the Brazilian Army. The first EET-1 Osorio, designated as the EET-1P-1, was built in 1985. The P-1 Osorio used a 105mm L7 gun and was originally meant for Brazil. After 1985, Engesa started building the EET-1 Osorio P-2 with the French 120mm GIAT gun, which was finished in 1987 for the Saudi Arabian trials. With the prototype constructed, the vehicle was subsequently sent to Saudi Arabia for the 1987 trials against the French AMX-40, the British Challenger 1, and the American M1A1 Abrams. The AMX-40 and the Challenger did not meet the initial requirements of the Saudi Arabians, and as a result, only the Osorio and the Abrams remained, of which the Osorio would win the trials. The Osorio's triumph over the Abrams can also be found in some United States documents as well. The specific reasons why the Osorio won are somewhat unclear. Five reasons might have contributed to its victory. Number one, its aiming systems perform better than those of the Abrams. Number two, the Saudis place less priority on armour protection, as the Osorio from a weight point of view is much lighter than the Abrams, which suggests significantly less armour. The Vickers Mark IV turret, of which the Osorio used a modified version, could supposedly protect against 105mm cannons, according to Vickers documents. Number three, trials like these can be paid off, and it is not unthinkable for countries to pay off these kind of trials to get sales. This of course could also count for the United States, although no sources confirm any corruption from either Brazil or the United States. Number four, the no strings attached policy of Ingesa. Number five, its cost, which was estimated to be around $2.5 million for the Osorio compared to $3.65 million for the M1A2 with ancillary equipment, since by the time Saudi Arabia would have ordered the M1A1, it was no longer in production. But the Brazilian dream of a main battle tank leading its defence industry on the world stage beside Western powers was not to be. The Osorio would potentially have been the saviour for Ingesa if the Saudi Arabians had continued with the sale. But whether Ingesa was even capable of delivering the Osorio in time after the agreement, considering all of its foreign components, is questionable. From 1986 on, Engesa's deliveries would be gradually more delayed, which became even worse after the end of the Iran-Iraq war in 1988. Saudi Arabia still had not finalised its stance on the Osorio project in 1988, and would never formally deny or sign the final Osorio contract, even when they ordered the Abrams in late 1988. By then, the Osorio had trialled for the United Arab Emirates as well, Libya also showed interest in the Osorio, together with another unknown country, presumably Iraq. Another important factor usually identified in the death of the Osorio, and indirectly Engesa's bankruptcy, was United States politics. Documents regarding the United States' stance towards the Brazilian defence industry seem to disprove this up to a point. Studies conducted on the Brazilian defence industry have yielded two options which the US should have chosen. The first is undercutting the Brazilian defence industry, and the second is getting more control over the defence industry through loans, and thus have an additional industrial base for potential manufacturing in the American continent in the case of war. The sale of the Abrams would mainly be important for local production in the US, instead of for undercutting the Brazilian defence industry. In November 1989, the US government approved the sale of 315 M1A2 Abrams tanks to Saudi Arabia, two years after the Osorio was selected. Saudi Arabia probably changed its mind on buying the Osorio for the following reasons. 
Engesa's continued financial struggles made it doubtful for the buyer if they were able to deliver the tanks on time. The Osorio's high dependency on foreign components and the licenses that would have to be acquired to produce it would most likely have caused delays. The delivery schedule of 17 vehicles per month would have taken a logistical marvel to pull off, while the M1 Abrams was a tank already in production by a country with experience in tank building. Engesa's exceptional prototype did not guarantee a successful production vehicle. Finally, the US had financial interests in selling the M1 Abrams to secure potential future sales in the Middle East and domestic manufacturing jobs. It seems that, although the United States unmistakably had political and financial interests in selling the M1A2 Abrams, these were not the key issues. In Jace's debt problem, which the Osorio was meant to solve, and the extremely high dependency on foreign parts, became the main reason for the Osorio's and Engesa's undoing. Motopassas Motopassas S.A. Transmissor Sens Engrenagens was founded in 1956 and was the largest manufacturer of differentials in Brazil during the 1970s. In conjunction with the army, Motopessas helped revitalize or modernize older or hard-to-maintain equipment. In the early 1980s, Motopessas was responsible for the modernization of Brazil's fleet of M113 vehicles, giving rise to the M113B. In 1984, Motopessas made its big step into the defense industry of Brazil. It designed its first vehicle, which fittingly with their M113 projects, was an armoured tracked troop transport. Development started with the CTEX in 1983 and 84. The first prototype was built and entered testing. The first Shahua, designated XMP1 while in development, resembled an M113. It was well received by the army. Not long after, through some modifications, the Shahua 2 was built. One of the Shahua's strengths was its flexibility. Due to the state of the Brazilian economy in the 1990s, the Shahua II, even though it was very well received both by the army and navy, could not be produced due to budget reasons. The Brazilian defence industry starts to crumble. For all the successes of the Brazilian defence industry, certain events during its golden age of the 1980s heralded its imminent downfall. The first real setback was in the early 80s, when Bizelli, which had already taken a more supportive role in the industry, almost went bankrupt, and Ingesa failed to pay its employees. Under the veil of Ingesa's success, and the golden age of the Brazilian defence industry, Ingesa continued clawing itself further into debt. Instead of learning from its setback in 1981, and taking time to pay off its loans and set up a new business strategy, Ingesa started spending and expanding at a massive rate, it bought up and set up new subsidiaries and developed more vehicles, although they developed these because they saw either an opportunity or already had a potential customer. These included the Osorio. In 1986, they spent a loan on acquiring a storage unit instead of building vehicles for the Brazilian army. For all intents and purposes, any real setback would have put the company in financial trouble. In 1985, José Luis Whitaker Ribeiro, founder of Ingesa, stated the following, There's always money for arms. In two or three years' time we'll overtake Britain and France as exporters, and the market is infinite. But less than four years later, Ingesa was doing anything it could to stay in business. Two events would cause further problems for other companies as well. In 1988, the Iran-Iraq war came to an end. To give an idea of Iraq's importance to the Brazilian defence industry, of the about 1 million rounds of 90mm ammunition manufactured for the EE-9 Cascaveo, approximately half of the rounds went to Iraq. The decrease of sales was devastating, as on average, the Brazilian defence industry exported 80 to 95% of its total production. The Return of Democracy Another reason for the hardships of the Brazilian defence industry was because the Brazilian government was less willing to buy military equipment as a whole. In 1985, Brazil became a democracy again. 
the military junta had enough support initially after they had taken over in 1964, but from 1973 on, the junta started to lose popularity. Eventually, in 1979, the Institutional Act No. 5, that had banned certain political parties and taken away personal liberties, was reversed. From this moment on, more political parties were allowed, and Brazil started to move towards a democracy, which would, in 1985, elect José Sané as its first president. The horrible financial state which the democracy inherited from the military junta caused it to become increasingly unable to buy or fund new equipment for the Brazilian army. Although the budget had already reached its lowest level in 1980, well before democracy returned, the new government had a different stance towards the army compared to the military junta. The Brazilian army between 1964 and 1989. The Brazilian defense industry, in combination with the Brazilian army, is a very interesting case. Brazil had no real enemies on its continent for which it needed large armies. Instead, Brazil used its army to project political power on the South American continent. With the military hunter in power, the military received, more or less, enough support to develop its own vehicles and, most importantly, become independent from foreign suppliers. From 1967 on, the Brazilian army modernized itself with the help of its newly founded defense industry. The approximately 409 Cascaveos replaced the M8 Greyhounds and the Urutu enabled the Brazilian army to start using mechanized infantry. The X1 tanks replaced all combat tanks of the Brazilian army. The X1s would then in turn be replaced by the M41Cs, which were planned to enter replacement by the end of the 1980s or the early 1990s. An interesting addition to the Brazilian arsenal were four Marda Roland II anti-air vehicles and 50 missiles delivered in the late 70s. The Brazilian army attempted to adapt the Roland technology in national projects, but they never succeeded. The Cold War comes to an end, as does the Brazilian defence industry. The end of the Cold War was a troubled period for Brazil. The newly born democracy spent 10 years battling inflation and economic instability from 1985 onwards, which it had inherited from the military hunter. With the government preoccupied fighting economic collapse, the defence industry found itself in a tight spot. The Iran-Iraq war had come to a close in 1988, and the economic repercussions for the Brazilian defence companies were extensive. The end of the Iran-Iraq war did not mean a complete halt to arms sales, though. Iraq still bought equipment, but not as frequently anymore, and the country supposedly owed millions of US dollars to the Brazilian defence industry. The new situation was troubling, but not disastrous. However, November 1989 heralded the end of the Brazilian defence industry. The all-important Osorio deal with Saudi Arabia turned sour and the Saudi Arabians bought the M1A2 Abrams. Enjasa's constant debt problem and megalomaniacal management had finally caught up with the company. The Osorio project was just the beginning. In the 1990s, various events would doom the Brazilian defence industry, which to this day has not managed to revive itself. After every golden age, there is a dark age, and the dark age had most certainly arrived. With the end of this video, the writer would sincerely encourage everyone to take a look at the article itself, as it provides a much more complete and extensive overview of Brazil itself, and the projects, companies, and institutions which were either undertaken or created at the time, which were impossible to cover in this video. The author would also like to give special thanks to Expedito Carlos Stefani Bastos, the leading expert on Brazilian armoured vehicles, José Antonio Valls, an ex Engesa employee and expert in Engesa vehicles, and Guilherme Travasso Silva, a Brazilian with whom the author was able to endlessly discuss Brazilian vehicles, who was always willing to listen and hear his near endless ability to talk about them. And that concludes this video. You can find other articles and more information regarding Brazilian vehicles on our website. Ratings, comments and subscriptions would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Reddit. We also have a link to our Discord community server in the description below. If you would like to help us continue and refine our work, also consider donating to our Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.